One advantage to having a bookshelf full of real books is that you, every once in a while you can just walk in front of it and pull books off the shelf. For example, um, I, I uh, looked at my books today and I picked up a copy of G.K. Chesterton's St. Francis of Assisi, which is a wonderful book. You just dip into it and read stuff in it. Another one I picked up was the collected verse of Theodore Rutke, Words for the Wind, Indiana University Press. And again, there are poems in here that are very, very famous, like Root Cellar and Cuttings and Pop My Papa's Waltz. But there are lots of poems that don't ever get and, uh, apologized, like the lighter pieces and poems for children. I'll be looking at that off and on all day. Maybe I'll do another uh, video on that. But the one that's really struck me is Wendell Berry's book uh, of essays, both cultural and agricultural, as he says in the subtitle, A Continuous Harmony. And the, the phrase continuous harmony comes from Thomas Hornbein in his book, Everest, the West Ridge, where he talks about um, walking through uh, the mountains in Nepal and uh, about... Um, how the land doesn't ever seem tamed and how um, while he always runs across people um, these people use the earth with gratitude as he's knowing that care was required for continuous sustenance he rotated crops controlled the cutting of wood bulwarked his fields against erosion in this peaceful coexistence man was the uninvited guest and it's uh, this sense of man being an uninvited guest is called living in continuous harmony. So the quote that I have, that quote um, fits especially oddly with uh, the, a def an essay near the end of the book. It's called In Defense of Literacy. Literacy. And I'm going to read an excerpt from that and, and conclude with what you see, the text you see on the screen. In Defense of Literacy. In a country in which everybody goes to school, it may seem absurd to offer a defense of literacy. And yet, I believe that such a defense is in order, and that the absurdity lies not in the defense, but in the necessity for it. The published illiteracies of the certified educated are on the increase, and the universities seem bent upon ratifying the state of things by declaring the acceptability in their graduates of adequate, that is to say, of mediocre writing skills. The schools, then, are following the general subservience to the practical as that team has been as that term has been defined for us according to the benefit of corporations. By practicality, most users of the term now mean whatever will most predictably and most quickly make a profit. Teachers of English and literature have either submitted or are expected to submit, along with teachers of the more practical disciplines, to the doctrine that the purpose of education is the mass production of producers and consumers. This has forced our profession into a predicament that we will finally have to recognize as a perversion, as if awed by the ascendancy of the practical in our society, many of us secretly fear, and some of us are apparently ready to say that if a student is not going to become a teacher of his language, he has no need to master it. In other words, to keep pace with the specialization and the dignity accorded to specialization, in other disciplines, we have begun to look upon and to teach our language and literature as specialties. But whereas specialization is of the nature of the applied sciences, it is a perversion of the disciplines of language and literature. When we understand and teach these as specialties, we submit willy-nilly to the assumption of the practical men of business and also apparently of education, that literacy is no more than an ornament. When one has become an efficient integer of the economy, then it is permissible, even desirable, 
to be able to talk about the latest novels. After all, the disciples of practicality may someday find themselves stuck in conversation with an English teacher. And here's the, here's the text that is the clincher here. I may have oversimplified this line of, that line of thinking, but not much. There are two flaws in it. One is that among the self-styled practical men, the practical is synonymous with the immediate. The long-term effects of their values and their acts lie outside the boundaries of their interests. For such people, a strip mine ceases to exist as soon as the coal has been extracted. Short-term practicality is long-term idiocy. And he goes on to describe uh, the other flaw in his argument just as devastatingly, but I, you know, you can find an, uh, a copy of this uh, essay online. If not, uh, DM me and I will find one for you. Thanks for listening. Short-term practicality is long-term idiocy. If we're not living and dying by that and mostly dying by that right now, I don't know what we are.